All right, everyone, it's three o'clock. I'm going to mute myself and then hit broadcast. All right. Welcome to today's webinar entitled COVID-19 and the path to the profession. Is a legal career still the right choice? Opportunities for diverse lawyers and why diversity matters. Uh, today's webinar is sponsored by the ABA Council for Diversity and Educational Pipeline and the section of Civil Rights and Social Justice with co-sponsorship from the Commission on Racial and Ethnic Diversity in the Profession and the Coalition for Racial and Ethnic Justice. Today's panel is, is only one of many in a series of rapid response webinars on the COVID-19 pandemic. And we are actively planning additional COVID-19 programming on a variety of issues. So please visit AmericanBar.org slash CRSJ for updates on these programs. My name is Matt Archerbeck and I am the chair of the ABA's Council for Diversity in the Educational Pipeline or Pipeline Council for short. And I will be moderating today's panel. The Pipeline Council, is charged with working with partners within and outside the ABA to expand opportunities for diverse students to enter the legal profession. As we are all aware, the current pandemic has caused enormous disruptions in our society. And as we're also aware, these disruptions have had a disproportionate impact on communities of color, persons with disabilities and low-income communities. In addition, law schools and the legal profession generally are facing unique challenges as a result of, COVID, of the COVID-19 crisis. Some diverse law students and those contemplating law school in the future may be asking themselves, in this time of great uncertainty, is a legal career still the right choice for me? In addition, students may be struggling, adjusting to virtual and online instruction that have become the standard during this time. Although the pandemic has brought challenges, it may also present particular opportunities for diverse members of the profession. In addition, what are the resources that are available to diverse students to navigate the difficult decisions about going to law school and becoming a lawyer? Today's panel will discuss these and other related topics. During today's program, we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists. As an attendee, you should see a control panel with controls such as audio options, chat, raise hand, and Q&A. For the purpose of this webinar, we ask that you submit your questions through the Q&A, not the chat function. You also have the option of upvoting or commenting on other attendee questions. If you do not see these controls, please ensure that your screen is not idle. For those of you watching through YouTube live stream, you may also submit your questions through the YouTube chat. These will be re relayed to the panelists by ABA staff. We will be sharing a recording of this program to everyone who is registered so that you can share it widely with your networks. Let me briefly introduce today's panelists. We have Gretchen Bellamy, who is the Senior Director of Education Operations and Initiatives at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Rodney Fong, uh, he's the Associate Dean for Academic Achievement Program, and Program Assessment and Bar Preparation at the UIC John Marshall Law School. Uh, Faye Lopez Getke, Director of Educational Equity Initiatives at the Law School Admissions Council. Judge Dean Lum, uh, assistant presiding judge uh, in King County, Washington, and uh, John Pierre, chancellor of the Southern University Law Center. Let me start with a question uh, to Faye uh, Lopez Getke at, at LSAC. Can you give us some background generally about how the pandemic has impacted historically marginalized communities? Sure, thank you. Thank you to the ABA for um, putting uh, these webinars together. I really appreciate that. Um, really quickly, because I didn't have a really cool link uh, to a bio, I'll just really quickly say that um, previously to work into, at, at LSAC, I just started with them last summer, I was working on police reform, uh, under, uh, representing underrepresented communities in Seattle, Washington under consent decree. And then before that, uh, so I did that for five and a half years, and before that I, I, was the, I worked at Seattle University School of Law. Um, so the Law School Admission Council's vision is to build a more just and prosperous world, and our mission is that we continue to promote quality, access, in, and uh, equity in law and education worldwide. We embrace and value the differences that all people bring to the table, but we also acknowledge that there is historical, institutional, and structural disempowerment of targeted communities. And during the pandemic, 
we see those inequities come into stark view locally and nationwide. For example, in the April 7th article in the New Yorker called Inequity Intensifies the Coronavirus Crisis in Detroit, the impact of COVID-19 on the Black community is devastating. In Michigan, while African Americans account for 14% of the population, they made up 41% of COVID-19 victims. Louisiana's numbers were even starker. African Americans are 32% of the population, but accounted for 70% of the deaths from COVID-19. Those demographic statistics are playing out all over the nation. In Washington state, where I'm from, I live in Seattle, um, Latinx patients tested positive for the virus 16% of the time, which is more than double the rate of white patients. There are a number of reasons why this may be the case from living in smaller multi-generational homes, being largely essential workers, language barriers, and so many other things. Healthcare, housing stability, employment, education, incarceration, wealth distribution, and history all play intersected and complicated roles regarding disparate impact to our diverse communities. And those inequi inequities, while they have always been here, are much more visible during the pandemic. Can you talk to us a little bit, Faye, about why these inequities matter when thinking about diversity in the legal profession? Well, we must be concerned because those issue, issues are impacting the ability of students to start, maintain, and even complete their college experiences. COVID-19 is only highlighting and exacerbating inequities through our, throughout our country and institutions. I can tell you that if I had to go home when I was an undergrad, I would have been, I would have been challenged to finish this year. We lived in a 700 square foot, two bedroom house with six to 10 people ranging in ages from four to 55 in rural central, Amer central Washington. We had no internet, had barely, could barely afford electricity. Um, and internet cafes are still not a thing in, that, in, in my area from my hometown. Our voices need to be heard. While laws and policies are being debated, developed, and implemented, our communities that are, are often being shut out of the process. We need more diverse lawyers now more than ever with or without a pandemic. And to that end, you know, I'll talk about a number of things to help candidates, to help students during this time of crisis. Um, and we'll be discussing those resources that are available uh, to students later in the webinar. And I'll make sure to link that in the chat and send those to ABA, to the ABA so that those can be linked and sent mm -hmm. out to you later. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, and we will, we will talk more about that uh, just a little bit later. You know, uh, Rod Fong, I know that you have been concerned about the stress that the pandemic has been causing students, particularly diverse students. Uh, can you talk more about what about your thinking, what, what you were thinking is causing and contributing to that stress? Sure. The, the first thing I talk about is, is the concept of perceptions. Now, I know this is a bad scenario, but if we continue with that thought, we're not going to get any place. And as you mentioned earlier, uh, is this a challenge or is it, what, what, or is it an opportunity? So I think the first thing we need to think about in order to deal with uh, stress is to, to control how we perceive what's going on. And um, I assume people are on the line. They want to become a lawyer. So guess what lawyers do? <laughs> lawyers have to be problem solvers. Uh, we have to, have to be resourceful. We have to be self-directed. We have to be hopeful. And so what I'm trying to get at is, how do we perceive this, this situation? Can we turn it into an opportunity and exhibit those skills. Um, there's a saying in the Chinese uh, community called chaos, where brilliant dreams are born. And so mm -hmm. I think it's really important that those of you who are out there look at the opportunity that's, that's being created. And again, those traits that I mentioned, start practicing them, them now. Uh, guess what? When you're a lawyer, you need to practice those traits, creative, resourcefulness, hopeful, uh, think of a client. They don't want you making excuses. They want you helping them solve the problem. So guess what? Um, these are traits of a good lawyer. These are traits of a good law student. These are traits of a good student in general. And I think it's really important that, that you start exhibiting those traits. And guess what? It'll be great on your personal statement when you apply for law school. 
A um, couple of other things to, to deal with the stress. Um, one is to develop a routine. Again, develop a routine that's consistent with this opportunity. Uh, things from developing a daily schedule so you're not sitting around kind of thinking, mm, what do I do next? But develop a routine. Um, develop a good study place. Um, I realize there are challenges in some families and, and Faye, you described some scenarios that where it is more challenging. But again, um, you know, can we be resourceful? Can we be creative? Um, one of the things about studying um, is it doesn't have to be a noise-free situation 24-7. Um, it, it, it's probably pretty hard to do that in, in people's situation right now. So one of the suggestions I have is to think about um, the type of study task that you have to do. Which tasks require a lot of focus and concentration and then develop those times for when you really need quiet. And it may be when people in your house are asleep still. Um, it may be uh, negotiating with folks like you do with your roommates to, to get some quiet time. But keep in mind that your studying doesn't have to be quiet time studying all the time. And then again, I wanna end um, uh, with the, the, the positive attitude. Uh, again, this is an opportunity. You're getting the practice skills that you're gonna need um, as a lawyer moving forward. Yes, th th thanks. I know you, you've also been looking at, uh, at stress caused by online learning and, and uh, and the difficulties of online learning, Rod. Can you talk a little bit more about those challenges and, and, and suggestions you might have for people facing online learning challenges? Sure, um, there are two basic areas I, I want to address. One is online learning by itself is a whole new environment for everyone. You know, it's not like we could just say, oh, it's the same as in person, but it's on a computer. It creates a lot of different challenges. And, and keep in mind that some stress is actually good. Okay, so, so we don't wanna eliminate all the stressors out there. Um, and trust me, when you go to law school and when you become a lawyer, uh, there's gonna be a little bit of stress out there. Uh, and so some of the stress, stressors that are being raised are things like um, the online platform. I was kind of stressing out earlier today because my laptop kind of died. My, my, my voice went out, my uh, video went out. And so, you know, luckily I'm on my iPad now and it works, but hey, I found a resourceful way of doing it. Um, what are the expectations of, of the class, the course and your professor? Find that out, figure that out because that may change in an online environment. Mm -hmm. Also something that people don't realize, when you're online, it actually is more work. So allocate more time to study. Um, there's more expectations. Also, some of the stressors that you might be having. One is a change in lifestyle. I think all of us on the panel are have a, have a little additional stress just because of what we're going through now. Um, some of us are more afraid than others of catching the, the coronavirus. And some of us know folks who have not done well with it. Um, for, those, for those of you who are students out there, I'm sure moving home with your parents might be causing a little bit more stress. Um, actually after being away for a little bit. In fact, I've heard some students not wanting to go home because of that. Um, there's also disappointment. Um, the loss of a college experience, the, the socialization. Uh, I know I'm gonna be sad because the sporting events may or may not be online, uh, I mean, you know, available. Um, and then also we have stress created by an uncertain future. So with that, I want to give you a tip. Don't stress out on things that you do not have control over. All right, so think about it. What do I have control over? What don't I have control over? Let me give you an example. So um, in the fall, are courses going to be in person or are they going to be online? I, I know a lot of students are stressing out about that, but I'll tell you, you don't have control. Your administration, your deans, your chancellors are figuring that out right now and they're trying to make the best decision for you. But if you spend a lot of time worrying about that decision, it, it's really wasted. But don't get me wrong, I'm saying, yeah, you should focus on maybe what you should do 
in relation to what the decision is made. So if it's online, okay, I'm gonna do this. If it's in person, I'm gonna do this. But the actual decision, don't stress about. Um, and, and keep in mind, this is not gonna last forever. Um, I think most of our audience out there probably has a good 50, 60 more years to live. Hey, it's not gonna last forever. Think about that time, okay? Um, the other thing I wanna um, take a couple of minutes on, if, if you don't mind, Matt, is sure. I know for students of color um, and diverse students, there's also additional stressors out there caused by online learning. Uh, there's been a number of studies that I wanna share with you. And the main thing that happens with online learning is isolation, isolation. And that really triggers a lot of non-cognitive barriers, especially in diverse students, especially in students who are first-generation students. And, and some of those barriers I wanna uh, um, talk about, and I can't give it um, a, a long talk, but please look it up and Google it. Um, one that gets triggered is called lack of belonging. And that's something that the cognitive um, psychologists talk about a lot. That's where you don't feel like you're doing what everybody else is doing. You know, you think everybody else is doing all the work they're supposed to be doing, they're studying, they're not bothered by stress. Um, you think all these negative things and you put yourself in, a, in, in the other side or a bad position feeling that you're, you're the odd person out. And what cognitive psychologists have found is that when you feel like you don't belong, it affects your motivation, it affects your health, it affects your happiness. So keep that in mind. Another one is the isolation also triggers imposter syndrome. And I think a lot of you have heard imposter syndrome. Uh, believe it or not, 70% of people at one time or another have um, have incurred imposter syndrome. So it's actually pretty common. And you know, with imposter syndrome, the concern is that someone will catch you as a fraud, right? You, you'll go to an online class, you'll raise your hand, you'll say something, and you'll feel everybody is gonna look at you and think, whoa, this person's not smart, they're a fraud. And we see that happening a lot in law school because, I mean, there's a lot of in intelligent people there. So some of the things I, I just wanna get you to think about is to be aware of these phenomena, um, to be aware that some of the ways to, to, to counteract it, one is resilience, to be resilient and have grit. And I'll, I'll let you go online and take a look at that. And also to develop a growth mindset that everybody in school is learning and it is um, normal to learn, to make mistakes and hopefully make corrections on those mistakes. Um, and then, um, I want to leave you with, with a couple of thoughts. One is, um, you may have to be more deliberate and intentional in reaching out to others, to keeping in touch with your classmates, to keep in touch with your professors, um, to check your email so that you do not isolate. Because again, if you don't take the steps, you will isolate, you know, trigger those phenomena. And then the other is your school actually has a lot of resources People are still active from your academic support folks to your wellness centers, to your tech support, to financial aid, diversity and inclusion. Um, the folks you see on, on this panel, we're still active at our schools. Please reach out to us and don't isolate. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, thank, thanks, Rod. We, uh, kind of just picking up a little bit on, on that and the, the, the stresses of of being on online and, and during this time, uh, you know, one of the things that is going online is the LSAT. And we had a question come in from somebody who just took the LSAT last week, uh, and, and she described it as a nightmare. Uh, uh, she was kicked out of the exam uh, a few times, couldn't get back in, wasn't able to finish. And she said, "My software is not super old, but I, I think it couldn't keep up with the overwork system on May 18th. Too many people taking the exam at the same time." Uh, and then she, she went on to say, I feel that the LSAT Flex is creating inequality since most, mostly students with brand new software laptops are able to take advantage of this option, uh, while students with older laptops or no laptops at all are, are not able to. Uh, does anybody want to comment on, 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 on LSAT Flex? I know that was an opportunity maybe to, 
to take advantage of the of the online uh, environment, but I but that obviously that might not be working out for all students. I, I'll start. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Faye. So um, the LSAT Flex it was uh, was a response to the pandemic and also with an understanding that there is still a digital divide and also not quiet places. Folks could have asked, we did send out 200 laptops to students who needed them and with uh, hotspots if they needed that as well. Um, so it was, you could request if you didn't have the software or the laptop or technology. In addition, um, so it was kind of a case by case, so they would submit their requests. Um, it's a, I also link to the LSAT Flex so that, that folks can see the most commonly a, um, asked questions. Um, in addition, for folks who didn't have a quiet space, like I said, like I wouldn't have had a quiet space to take the test. They did offer vouchers, you know, whether it's for hotel rooms or looked for spaces in schools that could have, you know, a room all to themselves. So there were uh, uh, there were ways that LSCC tried to work individually with students, acknowledging cannot uh, address every single issue and every right. single. Problem, but certainly um, working that out, it was the May was the first one. Um, and so working those through those issues, I, I believe 98% of students who took the test didn't have problems. Um, but that doesn't mean that every, every person who did have problems isn't is not significant. That is significant to the student and um, certainly wanting to make sure that each of those issues are addressed um, is really important to LSAC, but also ensuring that they have software and computers and hotspots and places to be is is also a, a meaningful to us as well. But thanks, Faye. Um, I, maybe I can turn to uh, Chancellor Pierre. I, uh, as diverse students are, are contemplating law school, what, what roles can law schools play in creating pathways to the legal profession for students from diverse backgrounds? Thank you, Matt. Um, one of the things that I think we have a responsibility of the law school is to try to create ways to have students recognize how they can increase their chances to attend law schools. So we have a group of law schools that I refer to as access and opportunity law schools. Uh, Rodney Fong is at University of Illinois Chicago, uh, 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 the, Jane, the, uh, the, the John Marshall Law School, which is, I consider an access and opportunity law school. So one of the things we do is we work with LSAC to help students, who, for example, who have struggles with the LSAT to prepare for the LSAT. So we actually do prep courses. Uh, we've been working with LSAC to even try to help students uh, adjust to this uh, flex LSAT process. And those kinds of things really, really help students prepare for, for the opportunity for law school, because one of the big determinants of whether someone gets into law school is how well did they do on the LSAT. Some students, unfortunately, start out with a low score in the LSAT because they're not as prepared. And so we work with students to improve those scores. And we try to look at the best score because we think that's more reflective of what they they are capable of doing, as well as look at the whole file of a student. Uh, we look at student backgrounds. For example, a lot of students have to work in college. So their GPAs, undergraduate GPAs are not as high as they could be. So we try to look at the whole student. And we even work with students to prepare them by saying, perhaps you can go and get a graduate degree before you start law school. And that helps you uh, in terms of increasing your chances of getting into law school from a profile standpoint to help show that you've got the grit and the, uh, the resilience to be a good law student. So we look at those kinds of things as well as uh, even in terms of uh, our view of how we help students access first year. We do a lot of what we call summer bridge program that are gonna become more and more popular now because there's a recognition that a law school is a challenging uh, environment to be in, but we can help people be prepared to be successful in that legal education process. Thank you. Yeah, I, related related uh, to this question, we had one come in uh, from an admission counselor at California Western School of Law. And uh, she asked, do you have recommendations for how law school admission staff can support diverse students? as they prepare to start law school during the pandemic. 
What unique challenges should we be prepared for? And how can we best anticipate and meet those challenges with the, those admitted uh, who are at greater risk of hardship as a result of these challenges? So uh, would anyone like to talk about that? Yeah, so one thing I, I would say is this. One of the big issues, especially for diverse students and, and students from uh, low-income backgrounds, is they think about law school late and they take the LSAT late in the process. So we really worked on helping students to start thinking about law school uh, a year and a half before they enter and to start taking uh, exams, practice exams, accessing resources like uh, what LSAC has and what other folks have so that they can start preparing mentally first for the whole process. So they understand the financial aid access process, how to uh, enhance their, uh, their personal statements, how to really uh, go to the various fairs and how to really start picking law schools that really value what they have. I mean, obviously, everybody looks at U.S. News and World Report. And while, you know, the, the top schools in U.S. News and World Report are great schools, they're not necessarily a fit for the students who have to deal with a number of different factors in deciding how they access legal education. And educating people as to what they can do once they have a law degree is not so much dependent on where you graduate, uh, from law school. It is what you do while you're in law school and how you use all the actual skills that you will develop in law schools to create a pathway for a transformative career. Thank you. Yeah. In, in, any other thoughts about, about that question about um, how, how to support law students who are just coming into law school uh, like this year? Uh, Ron, any, any thoughts? Oh, sorry, I kind of <laughs> caught you off guard there. Yeah, I think you're still muted, maybe. Okay, trying to get unmuted. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it goes back to, to some of the things I mentioned before. Um, I think perception is really important to, to realize that uh, to be a successful law student is really having a good attitude, um, being resourceful, and studying hard. Um, sometimes students go into law school and they realize they're up gets a lot of really bright students. And sometimes we get a little intimidated uh, by those students or their, their credentials or whatever. But I'll tell you, based on 30 years, the credentials, the LSATs, they're not as important as your willingness to work hard, to do the work, resourceful, to be creative, to have a positive mindset. Um, and of course, to work with the resources at your school. As I mentioned before, I see lack of being an imposter syndrome at a lot of law schools. And we've got to be aware of that and find ways to uh, not let it affect. Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, oh. Well, maybe uh, uh, related to related to that, uh, we just got a we just got a question that came in about uh, it says regarding the suggestion by Chancellor Pierre to attend grad school. Is there a, a recommended concentration to take? Uh, I guess as an undergrad. Well, what what we do, I don't know if there's a recommend, but here's something we find that works for the people that we serve. Sometimes students aren't as strong with their writing skills. So we find there's a great program that we have at Southern University in the Masters in Public Administration program that works really, really well because students engage in a lot of analytical writing. Uh, they do a lot of research and they really, really spend some time thinking about policy. And that helps them when they come to law school because now they're, they're viewing the law from a broader perspective. So that's certainly an area. We also encourage students to pursue a, a, like an MBA, Master's in Business Administration. Uh, so, you know, a Master's in Communication. So there are a lot of different graduate school, uh, I think, disciplines that really, really work well to help students understand how they can be successful. And part of it is to develop 
a confidence to understand that they can take on uh, 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 disciplines whereby they've got to dig in deeper into the content than they would necessarily as an undergraduate student. So, I mean, those are a few examples of areas that we find that really, really works well for students and we think enriches the student's ability to be successful in law school if they, if they view that option because they may not have done as well in undergraduate school for a number of different reasons. But now they get an opportunity to dig deep and to develop what I call the rigorous uh, disciplinary uh, standards, understand how they work so that they will be prepared for the rigor of law school because law school is rigorous. But anybody who has what I call good analytical skills and a strong uh, grit uh, can really succeed because that's very, very important. Matthew? Yes, uh -huh. I have a couple things to add. If you yeah, don't. yeah, please, please, Gretchen. Um, Hi, everybody. Um, so just as um, Faye gave a little bit of background, I'll give a little bit more. So right now I'm working on strategy for UNC Chapel Hill, um, the entire university. And before that, I was a senior strategist for global culture, diversity and inclusion at Walmart. And before that, I was a, an associate general counsel in charge of global diversity and inclusion. And that included the legal department, ethics, compliance and global security. Um, I also have my own consulting firm that I do this with, but I wanted, um, as I, we, this group gathered together last week to kind of talk about what we wanted to share with you. Um, one of the things that is important to me is for, for everyone to understand that there are other pathways. I am not, as, as um, Chancellor Pierre and I talked, like I am not the rah-rah um, uh, go to law school person. I went to law school after I went to Peace Corps. I took the LSAT. I don't even remember what my score was, but I ended up having given, being given two pieces of advice. Go to the law school that gives you the most money or go to the, like, the highest ranked law school that you can get into. And my ego drove that and I ended up going to Duke Law School and um, doing their JD LLM program. But I did get a full ride somewhere else. And um, now, you know, as I was talking with a colleague once uh, several years ago, how do you um, say it's okay, especially as a minority, as an African-American woman lawyer, um, we are seen as unicorns. There are very, very few of us. And so now, it, and it's also very challenging for us to find a position. Um, everyone buys for us, but they don't take care of us, okay? Um, so a few pieces of advice. When you are going to law school, what I didn't know, um, like all of the top students were using Barbary books to study for those first year exams. I had no idea. I was sitting, writing my outlines and trying to memorize them. Um, and meanwhile, that was something that these other students had that I didn't. And in fact, I paid that board and gave away all my bar books to another a student who became a mentee of mine. But um, that's just one thing. I mean, I know it's also very expensive to get those books, right? It's, well, I don't even know, $3,000 now. So that's um, one thing. Um, with regard to the LSAT, um, Malcolm Gladwell had a really great um, a show. He's a podcaster um, well, and writer and all of that. Um, maybe a year ago about the LSAT, I would encourage you to listen to that and think about it. Um, I, I know I was not like a top, I wasn't a top law student. I wasn't a top test taker like this, but I still ended up being just fine. Um, with regard to like this gap year. Now, I, I, I bristle a little bit about going back to school first. I would only go back if I could get a full ride. Like I'm not paying because law school is already expensive. Um, so I wouldn't get an MBA unless somebody's paying for you. Um, or that's your dream. If your dream is to be a lawyer, then go be a lawyer. But also be able, when, once you do attain that goal of getting into law school, don't be afraid to um, say, this isn't the path that I want to go down. I went to a law school where like everybody was clamoring. There were I mean, like 200 of us um, who graduated from my class and there were 17 minorities. Um, and so everybody wants us. And okay, I went and worked at a huge law firm in New York City for two summers 
paid for my, my family in Cameroon's house to be built. I did things like that with the money because I knew that in my heart, I was a public interest type person and ended up turning down that offer because I didn't want to, I was dazzled by the money, believe me. I had all sorts of free food, I, you know, $75 for dinner, plus a guest got that, $50 for lunch, it was amazing. I think those times have passed, I don't know. But it was, th those two summers were great. But at the same time, I knew I wasn't being true to myself and what I wanted in the future. And they put me with a woman who um, came in as a second year after working at The Hague, and she wanted to jump out the window, 58 stories, because she had so much debt and she wasn't, it wasn't happy. So you have to be true to yourself. And when I turned down that law firm offer, I had no other job and I was pregnant in my third year of law school. And my I, a law professor just said to me, Hey, I was in Kenya. I know you were in Kenya. Um, you know, how about you come see me? I, I would like to start a new law journal. And I showed up to his office and that showing up that for me is 99% of it show up. I ended up getting, working on this law journal, getting a job with him. And unfortunately he just passed away, but he is a special master on silicone gel breast implants, um, global research analyst. Like he was that, that guy. And that was just because I showed up. So that's my other piece of advice. So be true to yourself, be flexible in this time frame. as Rodney was talking about um, this flexibility, even when we're thinking about the, the LSAT and taking it. Well, this is the first time. I can tell you as someone who has to convert all of my programs to online, it is challenging. And we have meetings across our, like all of the schools on campus. How do we do this? So be gentle with others right now. Um, and then I also will say right now, when we look at the demographics of the United States, they're changing. 15, the youth 15 and younger, is, they've already become, the underrepresented minorities have already become the majority, okay? So we're making that transition. Um, and so as Faye was saying, we need to have um, lawyers who represent the population of people. There are a million lawyers, if you can imagine, a million lawyers for 300 million people or, or almost 400 million people now, okay? And the percentage of those who are underrepresented minorities is tiny, it's minuscule, especially when you start looking at those who are in charge. And that can be from general counsel to managing partners of law firms to heads of, of nonprofits, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So I will make that push, we need lawyers, but you have to be committed. And how do you become committed? You hold other people's feet to the fire. And this is the other half of what I would like to tell you, which is for law firms, um, I consult with them a lot. And they always, they, it's the same thing. I wanna to go to recruit from the top 10 law schools. Um, they're the best at writing um, to Chancellor Pierre's point. And I'm like, well, I went to one um, law firm that was in, it's a small, medium-sized town. I'm like, no one's coming from the top 10 law schools to your town, okay? Unless they have a personal connection. So why don't you create a program where you send your lawyers out? If you think that, that minorities are weak in writing, because that's, that's always the excuse, they're weak in writing. If you believe that to be true, then go create those good writers, right? And that's something that, that law firms can do to help. And then when you're, well, I'll stop there, but because um, I do have more to add, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. We can plenty of time, so. Well, uh, maybe sorry. kind of along those lines. Oh, sorry. Oh, um, that, well, that, that just might be my own feedback. But uh, so but Gretchen kind of related to that. I mean, what, uh, what do you think students should, should ask employers? Uh, is, to, so to get to get real answers about about diversity and if that's important to them. Okay, so I, you want to see what their diversity numbers are, and you can find those in in, in multiple ways. So one, you can look at NALP. Um, NALP has good, especially for law law schools. Um, right now, I'm in charge of something called the Model Diversity Survey. And what you may not know is that law firms, um, often by their clients, their corporate clients, well, I don't even want to say it's just corporate clients, because that's not true, but by their clients are asked for diversity data. So tell us about the profile, the demographic profile of your firm. And so, you know, you have law firms getting 300 of these requests. 
So what I'm trying to do with this or what we're trying to do, the ABA, is say, here's a uniform um, survey and you can fill that out. The, the, the underlying piece of this um, comes from my time at Walmart and knowing um, how, how law firms may behave. So one, um, don't, if, if something seems too good to be true, it probably is. So if all of a sudden you're like, wow, there are so many Asian attorneys at this particular um, law firm, make sure that they're not including their China office. I've seen it done, okay? So if you want it, so one, ask for this diversity data, but then I want, I'm gonna give you a caveat. Um, I, this is one of the most disturbing stories that I heard. Um, and this is how you can get pigeonholed um, as, a, as a minority, or you could pigeonhole someone if you're from a law firm, I want you to understand. And also corporations need to understand this as well because they're asking for this data. There's a, a woman who worked at a firm, she was coming up for a partner, right? Um, they told her that she couldn't, she's African-American. Um, and they said, you know, she had worked on one corporate client's matters for her entire career, despite asking for different assignments to be put in a different group, all of those things. But she worked for this one client. Why did she work for that one client? Because the client wanted diverse, a diverse team, right? So now it comes time for her to become the partner. And they said, well, you didn't rain me. You didn't go out and get new clients. You didn't do all these other things. So you want to know what is the track for everyone, right? Um, if there isn't something that's consistent, that might not be a good environment for you to be in, right? So this woman ends up leaving that firm and going to another. And the corporate client never knew why she left. But now one of their most senior people is gone, right? So there's an opportunity that she could also take that client with her if they feel so close to her, but you don't want to be stuck. And so asking questions about what is the culture, I would like to know how many partners you have promoted, how many homegrown partners, which means you started at the firm, actually moved up and became partners um, you know, after however many years. What's the path to partnership? Is, it, is there flexibility? What does that flexibility look like? What do your policies look like? Okay, so you have the opportunity to work remotely. Well, who takes advantage of that? Can you show me the percentages? Because one of the things that you want is that the people at the top are leading by example, okay? Um, I had one person where the, the partner did not have to work from home at all. He had all the support in the world, but he did as the leader to show that it's okay to use this as an opportunity to you know take care of your family. And that's even more important today, right? Um, so I wouldn't ever go to a place without grilling them about culture and watch. The reason I turned down that offer from that law firm, because I mean, like I told you, I gained like 15 pounds, wined and dined, best restaurants, circus, like you name it. I saw it, I did it. But I also would get emails from people at two in the morning saying, I'm just waiting for this document from Germany. That for me was not the life that I wanted to live. I wanted to have a family. I wanted all these other things. And so I had, going back to my original comment, to be true to myself. And so that's what I did. Thanks. We, we've got uh, se several uh, questions here about, kind of about uh, the economics of law school. And uh, uh, one asks, where might we be able to seek out resources so that law school doesn't become an even bigger financial burden? Uh, and then, uh, several people are, are asking, like, uh, Chancellor Pierre talked about attending grad school, but what, uh, doesn't that just exacerbate the already daunting student debt issue? So it can, does anyone want to talk about uh, the financial aspects of, of going to law school and, and how, that, uh, how that fits into it? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll chime in. So, so, so one of the things you first have to do is you have to look at price points. Uh, because what happens is um, law schools vary in prices all over the country. Uh, and I'll give an example within my own state. Uh, we're, we're the most affordable law school price-wise within the state, but, but some folks want to go to another, say, private law school where the tuition might be $60,000 a year. Okay, 
<laughs> what I try to do is I say, okay, that's fine. And they may get a scholarship. They may get a scholarship that say covers half of the 60,000. And my scholarship might be, again, 50% of my tuition. But when we look at net costs and everything, I'm a better deal financially for them. Now, the, the real key is, can I show that student a pathway to success that is very comparable to what they will get at, at that private law school? And what we try to do is we show them all the resources, how that pathway looks like and why that becomes important. So the issue of graduate school, same thing. There are very affordable graduate programs. In fact, the, to be honest, in many graduate programs, there, there are better uh, financial deals in graduate programs than there are for law schools. But you have to look at it from a skills perspective. I think one of the mistakes that many candidates for law school uh, make is they don't understand the financing of the legal education and what comes with it. So you have to do a really, really good job of understanding the finances. One of the things that I think we're attracted to many law students is that some undergrad, some law students go to what I would call expensive undergraduate schools so that they're not going to take a, a, on an exorbitant amount of debt in, in law school. So we're very attracted to those kinds of law students. Whereas a, 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 a law student that maybe went to a very inexpensive undergraduate school might say, I can afford to uh, try to take on this expensive legal education. So it really depends upon your own individual circumstance as to whether uh, this is the way you wanna go. One thing I tell students all the time is that this is an investment in yourself. You cannot view it as a cost. You have to view it as an investment and you have to determine how much are you worth as an investment. When you, when you start thinking about it from that perspective, then that helps you analyze what decisions you make in this process, because the, the costs vary from place to place. And it also depends on where can you actually access legal, legal education. For example, my neighboring state, the state of Texas, Probably the school that everybody might want to go to is the University of Texas, but it's hard to get access to the University of Texas. And so I sell them on the idea that you can get a quality legal education and you don't have to necessarily go to the University of Texas. That's not the only game in town. So it's all about perspective and your viewpoint. And once we can show you examples of how success can be modeled, uh, I was listening in the Gretchen uh, Bellamy talk about Walmart. One of the most successful people at Walmart was Claire Babino Fontenot, a graduate of Southern University Law Center, who is now the CEO of Feeding America. She might be the most important chief executive officer in America right now. But she came to Southern University Law Center, a very inexpensive law school in the whole a United States, probably at that time, probably the least expensive law school in the United States. And she became the number three person at Walmart. So that's an example of where you can go, how you can have a transformative career impact on people, despite the fact that you did not go to quote a top 50 law school according to US News and World Report. And Claire was always true to herself about what her goals were. May I add um, a little bit here, Matthew? So mm -hmm. Claire Babineau Fontenot is the one that gave, that I was talking with um, that helped me be okay with the fact that I have a mortgage on my brain. Um, and she's like, you can't go back, okay? And make that left turn instead of a right turn. That woman is very important and wonderful. And yes, I love her. Um, I will say, you know, when you're, there's part of you when you're, I agree with the investing in yourself, but literally I will never pay off my student loans. I, there's no reason for me to like push forward um, beyond the minimum. Um, it's always just going to be there. And so you have to say like, I'm okay with spending depending on how much, how expensive it is. Um, I did actually pay off one student loan. So I, at one point I was paying $1,300 a month in student loans, 
Now I pay half that. Um, but so that's, that's one thing. Then you have to think about who's willing to invest in you and pay you. Like this, the couple of years ago, the starting salary for um, new lawyers was about forty-four thousand dollars a year. So when you're doing the economics of that, like that's what you need to start thinking about. If I take on two hundred thousand dollars worth of debt, um, and I'm making forty-four thousand, and I'm doing following my dream, because there are very limited numbers of those high-paying um, law firm jobs. Okay, um, so you have to balance that. And I will share with you, I was in charge of the summer pro internship program when I was in the legal department for Walmart. And I was told by the recruiters, and this is where you have to, and I, I'm just giving you like life advice. You just have to speak up and do the right thing. I was told by the recruiters, you can all, you have six positions, you need to pick six law schools that are right here, okay? And I was, and you can, and, and, you know, maybe one or two that's outside of that, like Central America, Central America, not, you know, not the Central America down, but not that, but um, pick out those schools. And I was like, well, gosh, like how many people are not going to have access? At that point, I think there was 179 law schools. And so I myself went and got all of the admissions and from um, the career services information for every accredited ABA accredited law school and sent it out because and COVID is a really great example. I, I'll use it. Imagine there's a guy who lives in Florida and he um, gets into Harvard, okay? Law school, awesome. His mom is sick though. Um, he went, he also applied and got into FIU. Well, so should I not allow this guy who went to FIU because he wanted to take care of his family, the opportunity to work at Walmart. For me, the answer was a hard no. And so when I look at the people, I, I don't remember, there's a, is it Whittier Law School? I mean, I had students from all over. They were very diverse. And what was really interesting, the way that I, I chose those students, I had a panel, a diverse panel of people, and we just read every application, 400 of them. And we all came, it was amazing how we all came around the same people. Um, and so like, when you're thinking about how you give opportunities out, when you're thinking about how you choose a school, sometimes you just have to say, my family is first, right? Harvard would have looked great, but my mom was sick. It's, you're no less worthy. And honestly, like the legal education and especially the trends, if you start reading about it, like the LSAT not being something that people, all schools are gonna require, blah, 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 doing more skills. That's what you need. Like the, you're gonna learn the theory in law school. You need to place uh, that will give you some practical skills as well. So that would be something that I would do. So Long-winded answer to say, you know. <laughs> Hey, no, thank you. Let, let me let me let me pull in uh, J uh, Judge Lum here. Uh, I know generally, uh, Judge, that you're kind of a, a half is glass the glass is half full kind of a person, and maybe you can tell us uh, some of your thinking about why the current pandemic might create further opportunities for diverse lawyers. Well, thank you, thank you, Matt. And just to, just to add, I couldn't agree more with some of the comments about uh, that uh, uh, Chair Pierre and Ms. Bellamy made about uh, law school education and, and thinking toward career, you absolutely have to consider cost. You absolutely have to consider, you know, what it'll look like when you get out. The whole purpose of going to law school is not just to go to law school. The purpose is to have a fulfilling career for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And, and frankly, you know, um, and we've talked about this for years and years. We had a long discussion about this. But if you're going into private practice, you have to consider how are you going to be able to attract and keep clients? And to me, that when I was in private practice, that was the whole ballgame. And uh, you have, and then, of course, there's a lot more to it than that. But <clears throat> that, in terms of promotion, in terms of making partners, and all, all the other things, it, you have to be client focused. Uh, and so uh, I couldn't agree more with uh, the idea that you have to consider your, your path to uh, getting into the profession. A succeed profession uh, and also pay off uh, the cost of your law school debt uh, because those things you know, will be front and center for you. Uh, just a little bit more about my background. I'm the assistant presiding judge for King County Superior Court in Seattle, Washington. So 
Uh, basically, that's uh, this, uh, this a county that includes Seattle, uh, Redmond, Bellevue, um, and uh, some of the suburban Seattle. We have about 3 million people who are about 11th largest judicial district in the United States. So we're, uh, we also have the kind of fortune or misfortune of being one of the first uh, epicenters for COVID uh, here in the United States. Uh, and we were fortunate enough to flat curve our our, our, our cases are going down right now, thanks to, to a lot of different things that, that happened here. So our court system uh, is really starting to dig out. Uh, so there's a couple of things I, I wanted to offer about, uh, about what's going on. Uh, the first is that we don't consider law school education as something completely separate from the rest of society. Uh, we've, we've talked, to, we talked about uh, some of the challenges for online learning and, and, and those issues that law schools are facing, law students are facing, but the reality is the rest of society is facing those too. We're all moving to online platforms to the extent we can. We're social distancing. We're doing every uh, everything in the court that uh, universities and law schools have to deal with, and frankly, society has to deal with. Uh, so it's uh, so with all those challenges, it's not like law schools siloed from the rest of society. Uh, if, if you choose another path, you're going to have to face a lot of those challenges, uh, regardless of what you decide to do. Uh, the second thing I want to offer is that um, when you're in the middle of a crisis, it's really hard to see uh, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years down the road. Um, I know that during uh, when we were kind of the epicenter here in King County, uh, it was really hard to even see toward tomorrow. Uh, we were so busy trying to shut down our court. We were try busy trying to keep them safe. Um, and so I know, and let's acknowledge it is really hard to look to the rest of your career. But really what you're doing is, is looking at the next 20, 30, 40 years and deciding what kind of investment do you want to make for yourself? And is, is this the right career for you? Not tomorrow, but for the rest of the time. This crisis will pass at some point. At some point, your state will reopen in, in some way, shape, or form. It's not a question of whether it's going to reopen. It, it will reopen at some point. And the question is, what is your role uh, going to be long-term in that uh, rebuilt society, rebuilt profession, rebuilt business, or whatever you decide to do? Um, but, you know, with all the, the problems that have come, uh, I think as Chancellor Pierre mentioned, there's some Incredible opportunities. Uh, we've seen in our court massive, massive issues, uh, and we like to say that this COVID crisis has simply exacerbated some of the underlying problems. But uh, just to mention, we we've had to shut down all of our jury trials. We're going to try our jury trial start up again in uh, July, but that's an open question about how whether we're able to do that. But we have a thousand active uh, felon trials ready to go to trial. Many of those people were in custody. They need lawyers. I was just talking to the presiding judge uh, for in Sacramento uh, Superior Court. They have 900 pending felony trials. And that's not even to mention the misdemeanor matters. All across the United States, our criminal justice system, you know, and we have massive, massive problems. But that gives rise to opportunities for lawyers to help solve those problems, particularly for communities of color. Uh, landlord tenant, vaster problems, but opportunities for lawyers to step forward and help solve those problems. Uh, family law, protection order, uh, you know, uh, child welfare and dependency, uh, juvenile law, vaster issues with vaster opportunities for lawyers to address them. Um, collection cases, receivership, bankruptcy, yeah. Massive problems, massive opportunities, uh, massive opportunities for lawyers to step forward to help communities of color address those issues. Uh, but it's not all, it's not all, right? Uh, we have, uh, I'm sure you've been reading the news, uh, seeing the news about law firms laying off, you know, partners, partners taking deductions and salaries. Uh, uh, it's true that the law profession, just like all other businesses, are, are undergoing a massive reorganization, and there will be pain, uh, just like all other professions, likely even in 
academia, in uh, education, in business, nonprofits. But with that, um, we will get out of this, and where there are massive needs, there will be needs for lawyers. Thank, thanks, Judge. Um, we're getting a few questions in the in the uh, question and answer about kind of prospects for internships and and then after law school, give, given the current pandemic. Does it, does anybody? I mean, it's hard to 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 predict exactly what it's going to be like in in a few you know three four years down the road. But um, does anybody have any thoughts about job prospects for people now contemplating entering law school? Well, let, let, let me let me chime in on that one, uh, actually, because Judge Lum has uh, uh, pointed out a very important piece of what we do, which is this. Because of the challenges that courts are having, there are, there are lots of opportunities for internships with the courts. And I have to commend the, the ABA uh, for, for the judicial internship opportunity programs and those type of programs that are providing opportunities for law students to learn about how they play a part in this whole process while they're interns. Now, one of the things that I think becomes important, which is something we have doubled up on at the law center here at Southern University and a lot of law schools, is because of the canceled clerkships with law firms, et cetera, we have intensified our public interest law uh, fellowship programs. So, so for example, we actually give stipends to students to get practical experience uh, with nonprofits, courts, governmental agencies, uh, et cetera. And we pay a stipend so that students can get those experiences so that when they are graduating from law school, they have real world experiences that will give them an opportunity to be more competitive in the legal market rather than them just sitting out and doing nothing. Now, that takes a little sacrifice uh, because they volunteer because that, you know, those jobs aren't there, but we have to dig into our pockets as a law school to provide them with the, uh, the stipend so that they really can have these particular opportunities. And the other thing that I think becomes important, and you see more and more law schools are doing this, is that we're looking for other places for internships. We have been very fortunate uh, with connections with the, in the Silicon Valley. Companies like NetApp uh, have really open opportunities, Elevate, Cisco. We have a, a partnership with uh, uh, an entity called IFLA, the Institute for the Future of Law Practice where law students are getting opportunities with corporations, nonprofits, and other organizations. And, and, and another organization like the Peggy Browning Fund that provides internships for law students who want to really work on issues related to labor law and workers' rights. So there are these uh, various groups that are working together to provide these opportunities for students to really get into what I would call public interest area, nonprofit law areas, even corporations. I mean, Apple has been doing a fantastic job in terms of providing internships. Uh, uh, so you find companies like that, like the Cisco's of the world. And what they're finding is that if you have a legal education, your talent and your analytical skills are valuable tools for them because they're all in the talent acquisition business. That's, that's, what, that's what I say they're all in. We even see uh, accounting firms like KPMG that have opened up opportunities for students. But the key is, is you've got to be flexible in what you view you're getting in terms of your legal education. If you want to only go down one track, you're limiting your opportunities. You're limit, and you got to be willing to go to places. You got to be willing to go to Seattle if you're not from the Seattle area. <laughs> we we encourage people to go places where they have never been, because that's where you're going to find opportunity. Because at the end of the day, what we say is this: while you get a job to begin your career, 
when you become a lawyer or when you get your legal education, you have the ability to have a, have a transformative effect. You go and create economies. Judge Lum is right. You can go create a practice, and that's what a lot of our graduates have done. So you're creating economies. You're creating opportunity. You're stirring the drink. You're not just out there <laughs> uh, just being an employee. You're stirring the drink. Become a drink stirrer. A bar? If I may add, you know, I, I want to encourage people not to not to uh, overlook, uh, for example, partnering bar associations uh, and terms of projects. Uh, you don't have to have somebody actually fashion uh, an insur internship and you apply for it. You create, as Chancellor Pierre said, your own opportunities. Let me give you an example. Uh, what's a uh, what's an unmet? We are trying to move toward a Zoom and remote platform uh, for many of our trial, uh, civil trials, because uh, we don't want people gathering. We don't want them coming into court. Court. We're concerned about a second wave this fall. We're trying to get people to, to access us remotely. But what about the digital divide views? What if everybody doesn't have access to a smartphone or a computer where they can zoom into a hearing? Um, you know, is, are we going to create a two-tiered or a more inequitable system than we already have? But some people can access uh, us and others can't, just depending on you know how tech uh, able they are or how, how accessible tech is to them. You know, uh, we're starting to talk with some of our partners out in the community uh, with the bar association about you know how can what we do to mitigate something like this. And I'm not saying you run out and you know go establish a uh, a similar program in your state, although you know, might be an idea. But it seems to me that if you identify an issue and work on a project, that's something that you can show future employers or law schools that you know you're thinking creative. You can think outside the box. Here's the problem, and here's the skills that I have to that will serve well in the legal profession and in law school. So think creatively about problem that exists in society. I'll tell you that. Um, you know, I've been a judge for 22 years. I think we've made more change in the last three months than we have in the last decade, I would say, just because we had to. Uh, and I think law students are creative and brilliant enough to come up with their own solutions. I, I want you to go outside the box. I'd like to add um, one of the things. So I, I've had every job. So I was the director of international public interest and pro bono programs at the University of Miami School of Law. Um, before that, I worked at a, a medium-sized law firm. One thing, in terms of jobs, the what advice I would give the students is, and I actually typed it into the chat for you, is um, PSJD. I knew it when it was PS LawNet, but it's also um, affiliated with NALP. And you can do reverse searches. Um, so, for example, like so, you can like search for jobs. But this goes to um, what Judge Lum was saying, like and. Um, Chancellor Pierre. So you can go in there and like, there are so many organizations. So let's just say that you are interested in China and the environment. So type those keywords into, into their search engine and you'll find organizations that are doing that type of work, okay? Reach out to them. And I tell that this is, I was giving advice to law students, um, but I mean, this is for people who are, are thinking about going to, to law school. Um, you then contact that organization and say, hey, you know, I have five hours a week that I would love to um, work with you on a pro bono basis. I can do research, whatever it is that you, you want to do. So that way, one, you're giving them the benefit of this free work, right? Especially because they're nonprofits and so they don't have the, the necessarily have the money to pay you, but you're also then having something that you can put on your resume to Judge, Lum, um, Judge Lum's point. Um, I want to also say, you know, when you're thinking and going back to the, how do I make the right decision? Like, how do I interview employers? Even if it's a nonprofit, like maybe you don't, like they, they do work in China and the environment, but you don't like the values of that organization, okay? So you have to be, again, discerning. Um, when I worked at a law, the law firm, I was, this is when I was not discerning. So um, I said, why did you call me? Um, you know, I, what was interesting about my resume? And they said, well, we have a commitment to diversity. 
I should have run away at that moment, okay? What ended up happening to me was I was on their website. There was four pictures that would kind of like pop in of different people. I was the only minority working at the firm and my picture was always one of the four. Like I was, I was like the Brady Bunch person moving around. Um, I got a copy room as my office and then everybody came in and they allowed me to paint it a different color. And I didn't know that maybe I should just pick what everybody else had. They were offering because my office wasn't ready. And so many people came in and said, Gretchen, wow, I remember when this was the copy room, missed that. Now we have to walk all the way down the hall and how'd you get this color of paint? Um, it was not a pleasant experience and I should have known in the beginning. So again, like going back to asking those questions, like having Martin Luther King day off from work that should be, yeah, civil rights, but it's like, you know, that was what they were touting like as a diversity initiative um, for me to come. So the, you just, it's gonna be hard. Like, let's be real. Um, it's hard now, it was hard after 2008. Um, it's also scary to be on your own. I mean, I started my own consulting company. It's scary to do that. Um, and not everybody's cut out for it but you are cut out for maximizing your potential, realizing that every student, like it doesn't matter. Like the, I was number, I don't even know what number I was that I graduated from, but at the end of the day, you know what they call me? Lawyer, okay? I graduated from Duke Law, just like the guy who graduated or girl, I don't know, could have been a woman. Um, number one, we, we both have law degrees. We're both lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. So like just cut that part out. Okay, so think about your money, think about what it is that you want to achieve in your life and not in that like five year, oh my God, I'm gonna be a partner. You're not gonna be a partner in law firm in five years, okay? But you may take many twists and turns um, just as I have. Some people go straight through. There was a question on there. Like, what, what do I have to offer a law school um, as someone who just graduated from, from undergrad? Well, go do something. There is a challenge, however. Um, I'm very concerned about the ability for underrepresented minority students who are taking a gap year. I hear this so much. Oh, well, like my kid will just take a gap year. It'll be great. Well, no, like that's not how it works really for underrepresented minorities. Um, and the odds are if there's a gap year, if you're thinking about like between high school and undergrad, or even saying like, I'm gonna take a gap year between now and law school and see if it's any better what are the odds that you as an underrepresented minority will go back? They're much lower than someone who has resources and can you know, jet off and have a great internship with their parents or something, I don't know. Um, but I just want you to like really think hard about all of those, like the economics of going to law school isn't just about money, okay? So there you go. So Matt, if I could chime in a little. Um, I, sure, I sure. Go ahead, on, I want to pick up on what um, um, Gretchen and the judge just said and take it a little further. A lot of the jobs that are going to be in existence in the next few years are not in existence right now. There are new jobs, there are new positions coming up all the time. Uh, the judge described some, Gretchen described one, create your own job, create your own position. Um, I've had six positions in the last 20 years I was the first person occupying five of those. So these are positions that were just created that were not in existence when I graduated from law school. But as Gretchen pointed out, um, you know, you will have talents, you will have skills and people will want to hire you. Um, part of it is being proactive. Part of it is being creative and thinking about what you want and then either finding that top of job maybe convincing the employer that they need that type of person or even you know, creating your own position to fill certain needs. So um, underlying all of that, I just wanna throw out the one word is network. You gotta network so you know what's going on in the profession so that people know that you're out there and you can keep a, a better pulse of, of where the profession is going. But again, a lot of the jobs that uh, the students on this call uh, are probably going to apply for are not even in existence right now. Can I can I also add into that because I think this is a really good conversation. Um, 
one thing I, I'm going to get back to the new jobs because the, out of the five jobs after law school that I had, three of them are, I was the first one in those positions too. And so that's really a key thing. Um, uh, I want to go back to one of the, the questions. I think it was from a law school admissions person is what can law schools and admissions folks do for incoming law students? I'm like, for, particularly those who are more disproportionately impacted in this time, I'm like, reach out to them talk to them and ask them, ask them how you're doing, what you need, you know, so, you know, don't, don't try to make up things that are going on, or if you don't know, a simple thing is to reach out to them and ask and, um, and work out those solutions. And it might be creatively based on what law school you are, the geographic location and the resources available either through the Bar Association, the Minority Bar Associations, or lots of other resources. And when thinking for those students who are really thinking about, um, you know, what to do and what schools and if I should go, um, talk to the schools. Don't be afraid. I, when I was going, to, I, I did not know any of these things, and I didn't know that I can go out and, and reach out and talk to them. Talk to them. Talk to the schools and advocate for yourself. And re really think about what you need to be successful. Like I needed community. I needed gente, right? And so it was really important that the law school had other Latinos and Latinas and Latinx people. And, um, and that they were connected with the community. Where I was from in central Washington, there was a lot of community. I also lived in Texas for a while, but Seattle, that community was sparser. So having that community in law school was gonna be really important to me to ensure that um, while my academics would be there, that I had the community to support me in that, right? So, and ask the schools about the academic support systems that you also have. What are the alumni? How do they connect with um, the community that is important to you? Those are really important questions outside of also the scholarships, you know, right? Is those things are, are things that you're going to need to ensure your success, right? And I, I also wanted to talk about other resources, um, particularly during the pandemic. And uh, again, I can put them in the chat or I'll, I'll send them to the ABA, but um, LSAC does have a resource page for um, students who are looking at that. And for pre-law advisors, admission folks or others, if there are other things that we need to be adding to that so that students could, who are navigating in this really time, please let us know, please reach out to us so that we can um, uh, consider those as well. Um, there's also cab candidate webinar series, you know, so um, LSCC is putting on and also, you know, coordinating with ABA, like doing this one, but to talk about a lot of these issues that are happening, to talk about the LSAT flex, talk about what's going on with admissions, you know, uh, and uh, also how to navigate, you know, being a 1L and potentially uh, going through and being a 1L during a pandemic where you may not be in school, right, and, and what that could look like. Um, we also have a free LSAT prep through Khan Academy. It's, it's a, a collaboration that we knew was really important to offer and ensure that everyone could have an opportunity to have LSAT prep. And that's a really uh, great feature that we've collaborated on. We also have fee waivers. Um, so really look into that program and see if you can participate, particularly if you are looking to, to um, go into law school or start the application process. And really wanted to know that you, that we're also advocating for you. So while all of us are here, uh, we also need to use our power in these positions, right? We need to be there for you too. Um, we are, uh, we participated in what Gretchen was talking about earlier. We collaborated in that um, with the um, minority survey uh, of the of the law firms, we think that is really important um, to part of our work, but also to join with 40 other organizations on an amicus brief uh, supporting affirmative action. Um, so we, we just submitted that, or we were part of that coalition that submitted that, saying student, student diversity improves learning outcomes and promotes academic success, prepare students for an increasingly diverse workforce, and prepare students to participate more effectively in increasing uh, diversity and, and, and interconnected society. You matter for all of those reasons and so much more, but we don't need to tell you why you matter in higher education and the legal profession. We as gatekeepers, every single one of us, need to be also be your advocates and your allies and your warriors. And so, you know, we also need to hold our own feet to the fire and to ensure you are supported as best as we can. Thank you, thank you, Faye. Yeah, um, I know we're we're down to about maybe ten minutes left in the in the uh, 
in the webinar, and I wanted to see if we could answer some of the questions that are in the, the uh, Q&A. So uh, maybe I'll go to some of those. Um, what, uh, someone asked a question, which I think is an interesting, I guess there are a couple different ways you could look at it, but they say, with most law schools online due to the pandemic, what are your opinions about students who attend an online law school? Uh, obviously, there are law schools that are current before the pandemic were online. Uh, do, 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 do their stock kind of go up a little bit? And I guess there's also the question, I think someone also had a question about, is there a worry that, uh, that employers might look negatively at students who, uh, who were kind of regardless of what law school they go to if they kind of were, had an on, online curriculum? Any thoughts on, on that? If they're judging you like that, don't go work there. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's straight up, like that's not a place for you. You don't have to justify your being to phase point, right? Like I, that's, we all have different life experiences and different things that are going on. And if some play, employer can't understand that, then really, please just move on. But I don't know if that's what you're looking for, but that's what I would. I don't think it matters. What matters is how well you learn in an online environment. You have to decide if that online environment is best for you. Again, you, the investment is in you. You have the power to be the transformative agent at the end of the day. Don't let it, other folks dictate to you what you have the power to do. Right. Uh, okay, well, uh, here's a question about the bar exam. Uh, a concern with the many restrictions added to the various jurisdictions uh, because of the pandemic taking the bar exam. Um, and, you know, there's there's some stress around around the bar exam. Any any thoughts or advice about about taking the bar now? I mean, obviously, for uh, if you're not even entering law school, hopefully by the time you, you would graduate, things are different. But if but if you're in law school, this is definitely a, uh, something that you're worrying about right now. Any any thoughts about uh, restrictions due to the bar exam? Um, right now, every state controls how they're going to administer the bar exam. And we're seeing every day new variations of the bar exam for different states from, and to, to give you a little bit of feeling of control, uh, a lot of concerns are logistics. Um, how many of the social distancing, the social gathering um, uh, factors are very, very much on the minds of the uh, uh, bar examiners. And what we're finding is you can only fit so many people in a room requiring more and more locations. Um, some jurisdictions are experimenting with online uh, remote taking. They kind, kind of like LSAC Flex or LSAT Flex. Um, there's different variations of how they're going to monitor things online. So, so the bottom line is for this summer's bar, which includes possibly a July and or September bar, you, you just kind of have to go with it. And again, um, as I mentioned earlier, you have to be resourceful. Um, I saw one question about someone who wants to take the New York bar, who's a resident of New York, but went to law school in another jurisdiction. I believe it was DC. Um, right, right. Yeah, um, the New York bar is finding logistics. Um, their main site was the Jacob Gavitz Convention Center, which held I think like eight or 9,000 people, um, it has now been turned into a medical facility, thus they can't do it, uh, plus the social gathering uh, rules. So they are limiting the number of people to take the bar in their state. The first um, round of registration is limited to ABA uh, law schools in New York. Um, that doesn't mean that people who want to practice in New York cannot take the New York bar. Think about this, the New York bar accepts is one of the uniform bar jurisdictions. So you could take the bar exam in another state that administers a uniform bar. And if you score above the cut score in New York, you can transfer that score into New York. Um, so that's the advantage of the uniform bar. Um, I have a couple of students who are in the same predicament. I think one is taking the bar exam in New Jersey and the other one is staying in Illinois, taking the Illinois bar and assuming they get the appropriate cut score for New York, will transfer their score to New York and then become a New York licensed attorney. 
So again, it takes a little bit of creativity and resourcefulness, but it can be done. Thanks. Maybe back to you as well, Rod. There's, we have a question about uh, what are some things I can do as a non-mental health professional? And then they, they mentioned specifically their law school doesn't have counsel, a counseling office to support students of color uh, while at law school. Yeah, you know, as I mentioned, there, there's um, stress and mental health concerns caused by just everything that's happening now. Um, the the uh, factors that I mentioned, the non-cognitive barriers are things that I picked up from cognitive uh, psychology, psychologists or educational psychologists who really are exploring, uh, especially in the undergrad and, and K through 12 level, these non-cognitive barriers. What we find is a lot of the non-cognitive barriers do affect people in general, but they also affect students of color and people from diverse backgrounds and first generation students more so than other folks. Um, the good news is that once um, um, diverse students and first generation students, um, one, identify the non-cognitive factors that may be affecting them and can, and can um, uh, work to intervene. And there are a lot of websites out there um, on these factors. Uh, the factors again are things like growth mindset, um, resilience or grit, uh, lack of belonging, imposter syndrome, and another one is stereotype threat. I think if you Googled any of those, you will get a lot of information on um, these factors and they do definitely affect, uh, again, uh, diverse students and first generation students more so. Um, and if you want, um, please send me an email. Uh, my email address is rfong at uic.edu. And I'd be happy to send you information and links. Thanks, thanks, Ron. Um, uh, oh, maybe you already answered this, uh, Faye. Oh, and it looks like there's somebody who answered about LSAT Flex continuing. Uh, yes, sorry, I think that was answered. Um, well, I think we could just note that the June will be an LSAT Flex, and um, it's kind of a case by case, month by month um, basis. Also, nationwide, there are different different uh, openings and closings and different phases. Um, so it's uh, it's kind of, uh, we'll see as we go, but June definitely will be LSAT Flex. Okay. And I, I put more information, I posted that about LSAT, you know, where you can find more information about LSAT Flex uh, website. Um, all right. Any does anyone else ha have any suggestions for resources for for folks to look? I know Faye mentioned some, and I didn't want us uh, us to leave. If you had specific resources that uh, for people who are contemplating law school that you wanted to point folks to, uh, any any of the panelists? I, I just um, there's so many. There, I'm like answering all these questions. The ABA has a ton of resources. Um, local bars have tons of resources. State bars have tons um uh minority bars so you have like the national bar association which is um historically for black people you have napaba for asian american like so there's lots of different bar associations and you can get tons of information the national lgbt bar um one thing i want to make sure is we talk about this online platform is that we do take time to recognize that it can make it more challenging for underrepresented minorities to be seen. We are already not seen enough. And now with this like remote study, remote work, um, it can be even more challenging. And I'll, I'll put in a resource, it's more of just an article, but it's something that we need to really start considering. And again, when you're thinking about the questions that you're asking of law schools to face point um, or employers, these are things that you need to know like so that you're being seen. Um, and I also want to just say, you know, one of the challenges, we didn't really even talk about um, any disabilities, but, you know, with wearing face masks, I, I, we, I, we have a roadmap for UNC that I just edited yesterday for how we bring students back. And one of the things I pointed out was, if everybody's wearing a mask, what happens to people who need to read lips? 
okay? Like we need to really start thinking outside of the box and what are the challenges? So yeah, you may not have access because you don't have a computer, but you may not have access because your teacher is literally like this right now, right? With the face cover. Um, and recognizing that we will go back to campus. I know at UNC we are, but that isolation that Rodney was talking about is not just the online isolation, right? Or being isolated in your house and you know, like you're surrounded by trees like I am. It's, there's isolation on campus. I told you I had 17 underrepresented minorities in my class, okay? And like, I know them all, um, but I found it really challenging to break through and break out and have other people understand who I am and without just saying like, there's this black girl who is a lawyer. Um, and I know there's some questions and I'll answer them. Um, I don't know if it shuts down, but some people had asked some questions about that. But I, want, I just really wanted to, to point that out and that we are right now at the precipice of a, a renewed or revitalized civil rights movement. We're seeing it every day. And I hope that all of you, even with all the things I said, will consider going to law school, find an affordable way, reach out to me if you wanted to talk through it more. Um, but this is the time to seize it um, and be at the, the forefront of this very rapidly changing legal profession. So. Thanks. Thanks so much, Gretchen. Uh, and, and, and to all of our panelists, thank, uh, I, unfortunately, we, we are, uh, I think our time is, is now, uh, it's 4.30, according to my, 4.31. So, uh, but uh, thanks to our panelists. Uh, thanks to everyone who attended. I'm sorry if we didn't get to all of the questions, but I think we, we, got, we got to a good chunk of them. And I know a lot of them were answered uh, in writing as well. But uh, thanks everyone for joining us for this free webinar. I'd like to, uh, again, thank our, our panelists and uh, you, you're doing critical work and, and thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to share your experiences with us uh, today. Um, this, the section for civil rights and social justice provides free webinars like this one uh, for legal professionals and advocates nationwide. Uh, and the Pipeline Council is planning at least two further webinars in conjunction with the section uh, relating to diversity pipeline issues, including one for current law school student or law, current, current law school graduates. Uh, so check back on the section's webpage uh, for more information about that. Um, but with that, I will say goodbye and uh, best of luck to everyone and, uh, and stay safe. Take care. All right.